Trance. That's why you're here tonight, right? And by tonight, I mean this afternoon. And by this afternoon, I mean, are you ready to hear about trains? Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready for some radio programs about trains? Yeah. Well, I've got some bad news. We're not going to start out with a radio program about trains. Instead, we thought we would allow Oklahoman of the Year, Kyle Dillingham, <laughs> to come and give you a little bit of train music. Are you ready? Yeah. All right! <laughs> ready to get this train on the tracks? Yeah. All right.
appreciate you squeezing us in between gigs. Uh, I contacted contacted him yesterday and said, "Are you in town? And can you swing by? We're doing a train show, and you have the perfect song." So thank you, Kyle. <laughs> You guys have fun. We, have, we, we just closed an exhibit about his incredible work with his band Horshiro traveling the world and performing in 41 countries. So anyway, we're moving on, in case you didn't notice, to our next exhibit, which is wedding dresses. And we'll have the rest of them up next week, but we have them dating all the way back to 1875. So 150 years of these gorgeous gowns worn here in Edmond. So I invite you to come back and see those. But first, I have to mention the train exhibit, because that's why you're here today, right? <laughs> I learned something really special about this train exhibit. It's a traveling exhibit from the Oklahoma History Center. And part of it is uh, photographs of Edmond trains, because that's how our town started with a railroad. The other is train photography by a man named Preston George. And I see some of you know Preston George because he lived here in Edmond. And somebody called me about a week ago and they said, I have to tell you a story about Preston George. When he took a photo, the photos that you see on that wall, one shot. He didn't do like we do, 17 and pick your best. He knew trains so well that he would position himself along the track, listen, and use his ear to tell at what point he needed to get the train and the steam and all of that. So, so when you look at those exhibits on your way out now, you'll have fresh eyes. It, sh it sure gave me fresh eyes on that exhibit. So we're really proud to have a, this wonderful photographer who used to live in Edmond. Uh, he has since passed, but I know a lot of you still know him, and we'd love to hear your stories about him. All right. Folks. We need you to use your ears because we are going to welcome to the stage our venerable cast. Three programs for you this evening, and we are going to start with a program called The Great Train Robbery from the Suspense Theater. Oklahoma Railway Museum brings you tonight's presentation of the story about a man who dreamed of someday having all the money he would ever need, and one day found a way to make his dream come true. The Great Train Robbery, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. My name is Walter Beaumont. I'm 42 years old. I have no prominent marks or features that would distinguish me from any other plain, ordinary citizen. I live with my wife, Bess, in Sacramento. If you saw me walking down the street, you wouldn't give me a second glance. The details of my appearance are very important. You see, they are what convinced me that I would execute a great train robbery. Bess and I have been married for 16 long and uneventful years. <laughs> the year before we were married, I went to work for a toy manufacturing firm. I've been down there ever since. And now, I'm making only $62 a week. 16 years ago, I had a lot of dreams and some ambition, but the necessities and responsibilities of our everyday living cost me most of those dreams and what little ambition I had. Walter, did you remember to pay the rent? Yes, best. And the installment on the washing machine? Uh-huh. And what about the payment on the car and the box springs mattress? Those two, Bess. Oh. Well, wish we had a little money left over, at least enough to buy you a new white shirt. I've already turned the collars on the three you own. Well, maybe we can get one next month if we're lucky. If we're lucky. 
For 16 years, it's been the same thing over and over again. A new white shirt, if we're lucky. A new pair of shoes, if we're lucky. The same thing never changes. Each night at 5.30, I drive up and park in front of our tarnished white stucco house where we've lived for the last eight years. And I know that nothing has changed. But tonight, when I got home, there was a change, a happy change, some relief, a new face, the face of a visiting long-lost relative, Cousin Eugene. Yes, sirree, Cousin Bess. That's just about the best meal I've had in a long, long time. Well, I'm glad you liked it, Eugene. One of these days we'll have you over for a real feast, Eugene. As soon as Walter Ship comes in. Oh, I'm a plain man. The simple things in life are good enough for me. Not for Walter. He's got ideas. Hi, and my... No, no, not anymore. He's got a dream world all his own. Well, Cousin Bess, we all do dream a little now and then. Do you have any definite plans for the future, Eugene? Well, Walter, I'd like to buy me a farm someday and maybe raise some... Chickens. Always did love chickens. <laughs> I think I would have done something like that. Oh, but go that ahead, Walter. Say it. If you'd ever have the money. Well, that's my problem, folks. Money. You've got to have money to buy a farm, and right now I don't have any. Well, that's a shame. Hey, and speaking of money, have you been up to Reno, Nevada, Walter? <laughs> no, no, I never have been there. <laughs> We don't get to too many places, Eugene. Seems like we always have something else more important to do with Walter's vacation money. Well, you've never seen so much money in all your life as there is in Reno. Yes, sirree, lots of excitement. All types of people, lots of money. I've often wondered what would Walter would do if he had a lot of money. He'd be an interesting man to watch. Him? And all his dreams. Yes, sir. All types of people. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. What did you say, Cousin Eugene? I said rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought you said. And then, Cousin Eugene gave me one of those long, lingering, meaningful looks. He leaned back in his chair and smiled. Eugene had made some kind of a decision, and it concerned me. It concerned me very much. The following morning, about 11.30, Eugene called me at the office. He told me he wanted to see me on my lunch hour. He said he had something very important that he wanted to talk over with me, and could I meet him? Well, I met him at five minutes after 12 in front of the ferry terminal. Uh, I'll just uh, eat my lunch while you... Go ahead and talk to Eugene. Is that all right? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Mm. Uh, Bess packs your lunch every day? Every day, for as long as I can remember. You'd be surprised how much money it saves. Uh -huh. uh, Walter, what would you do if I gave you half of, say, $25,000? Excuse me? For a minute, I thought you said $25,000. I did. <laughs> What are you talking about, you see? Well, you're a dreamer, so am I. There's only one way to make our dreams come true. We have to buy them, Walter, with money. That's why I picked you. Take me. Last night at the dinner table, I said there was a lot of money in Reno, Nevada. That's right. You did. Now, some of this money stays in Reno, and some of it goes elsewhere. You follow me? No. Not well, quite. some of it goes to banks, like banks here in Oakland and San Francisco. All right, I see what you mean. Now, how does it get to those banks? Well, some of it they drive, some of it they fly, and some of it they load on the mail car of a train. You follow me? Go ahead, Eugene. Go ahead. Go that ahead. train they load it on leaves the city of Reno every Thursday morning at 11 o'clock. <laughs> It arrives at San Francisco at 4.30 in the afternoon, following... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. After the train leaves Reno, it passes through a place called Soda Springs at 10 minutes to 1. And there follows a stretch of about 20 minutes before it passes a place called Dutch Flat. A stretch of nothing but lonely desert. Go on. And if one 
gentleman was to get on a train in Reno, and another gentleman was to drive a car to the deserted junction in between Soda Springs and Dutch Flats. The train can be stopped. The money taken off, and the gentlemen well on their way before the authorities could be warned. Why, Cousin Walter, do you realize what you've just suggested? Yes, you did. I, I just suggested we rob a train. The ferry boat pulled into Richmond Landing, and Eugene got off as he stepped down the gangplank, turned around, smiled, waved at me, and disappeared into the crowd. The following day at work, I had a hard time trying to concentrate on a new shipment of toy atomic tanks we'd gotten in. Right after lunch, the phone at my desk began to ring. I was almost afraid to pick it up, afraid that it might not be Eugene. Hello? Hello, Walter? Yes? Done much thinking about that matter we discussed? Yes, yes, I have, but Eugene, I was thinking, how could just the two of us... Oh, it's very simple. I've worked on this plan for weeks. You must have complete faith in me. Oh, I do, Eugene, I do, but what about Bess? How will I explain it to her? Oh, now you just leave that to me. But, but eventually... Eventually you can tell her, and what's more, yes? I know she'll understand. And so it begins. It's the kind of a thrill that comes once in a lifetime. When I was just a small boy, I had play acted it out many times, but now it was reality. I was going to rob a train of an estimated $25,000. We decided on a date. The robbery would take place two weeks from the following Thursday. That would give me ample time to prepare everything. Every day on my lunch hour, we would go over our plan step by step. Now, the baggage car is between the regular car and the mail car. There are two guards in the mail car. One is in the baggage car, and once we get past him, our problem is solved. But timing is an important thing, Cousin Walter. Absolutely. It must be time to the split second. Now, it takes 10 minutes to get to the junction, where the automobile should be waiting. 10 minutes. The emergency cord should be pulled 30 seconds before the junction is reached. Any questions? No, I've, I've got that, but I, I still, I'm still worried about Bess, Eugene. Now, don't worry about her. I'll talk to Bess. You just leave it to me. I'll talk to her. And he did. He roped Bess around his fingers as if she'd been butter. By the time he was through with her, she was begging me to take a week off and go for a little vacation. We'd find the money to pay for the trip somewhere, she said. But when Eugene suggested he finance the trip, that was the clincher. He told Bess he was going to take me up to the Hillary Lodge in Lake Tahoe for some fishing. Only he didn't finance the trip. I did. With the $178 I drew out of our savings account at the bank, we'd need money for our hotel room in Reno, the train ticket we had to buy, the gun we needed. The rest of the week went fast, and then it was Friday night, and we were ready to leave. Eugene was waiting out in my car while I was finishing packing. Oh, oh, Walter. Look, Bess, it's only for a week. I, I know, I know, but here, Walter, here are your other two shirts. You want to look nice and neat? Here, put them in the suitcase. Fine, fine, there, there, there. Well, I guess I'm all set. I'd better hurry. Walter, you will take care of yourself. Of course I will, Bess. Now, don't worry. I'll be all right. Well, I'll set Eugene. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, Eugene, you will take care of my Walter. Yes. Well, wh where did you say you were going now? At the Hillary Lodge. Uh, it's out near the lake. Oh, Walter. Oh, look, Bess. If I don't write... Please don't get worried. Yes, me. yes. Oh. I promise. Well, goodbye, dear. Take care and have a good time. Well, we're on our way, Eugene. Yep. Next time I drive down the street, I'll be a rich man. Who says dreams don't come true? Oklahoma Railway Museum is bringing you the great train robbery. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. 
The Oklahoma Railway Museum in Oklahoma City preserves railroading history and teaches how the railroad affects our lives. The museum works to preserve the disappearing artifacts, equipment, and structures of our railway heritage. They capture the memories of people who worked on and rode on trains. When you visit the Oklahoma Railway Museum, you'll see freight cars, passenger cars, and even a real steam engine on display. The museum is open every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 9 to 5. The admission to the museum is free. The museum also offers train rides on the first and third Saturday of the month, April through August. If you like trains, and you probably do since you're at this show, you will love the Oklahoma Railway Museum. And now, Oklahoma Railway Museum brings us back to our production of The Great Train Robbery, a tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Eugene and I arrived in Reno late Friday night. We registered at one of the nicer hotels and drove to the junction about 13 miles from Soda Springs. Eugene pointed out all the landmarks. This was where the train was to be stopped by pulling the emergency cord. On Tuesday, we went down to the train station and bought a ticket for the train on Thursday. Day after tomorrow is the day. How do you feel, Cousin Walter? Excited? Your plan is foolproof. Foolproof, of course. I've never handled a gun before. Oh, you won't be handling the gun. You'll be driving the car. You won't have need for a gun. Eugene, I think the position should be reversed. I should be on the train. You should be in the car. I'm sorry, Cousin Walter. There's one detail that could very well cause our plan to fail. But what are you talking about? Identification or descriptions. Eugene, look at me. All right. Describe me. Go ahead. Look, look at me and describe me. Well, you got sandy hair. That's right. So, have two million other men. Now, go ahead. Then, well, just sort of plain looking. Exactly, Eugene. Exactly. Don't you see? When the guys on the train try to describe me to the authorities, they'll have a very difficult time. I have no prominent features to single me out from any other plain, sandy-haired man of 42 years. Cousin Walter, I believe you brought up a very important point. Thank you, Eugene. So, I'll handle the gun, and you drive the car. We went back to the hotel, and we went over the plans again. All I was to take from the mail car was one money bag. Eugene figured that each bag ought to contain about $25,000. With one half of that, he figured he could start a pretty good-sized chicken farm. It was close to nine when Eugene shook me awake. This was the day my heart was already starting to beat faster. I took a shower, shaved, and got dressed. I put on my last clean white shirt. At breakfast, we went over the plan one final time before he drove me down to the station. Don't forget to put the money in your suitcase, cousin. Yes. Are you nervous? Yeah, a little. Don't fire the gun, whatever you do. We don't want anyone to get hurt. Yeah, I understand. Good. Now, remember, you've only got 10 minutes to get to the mail car and get the money. All aboard! Well, it's time. Good luck, Cousin Walter. Thank you, Cousin Eugene. Thank you. This was it. I found my seat and I sat down. Oh, I could feel the perspiration running down my back. I was ruining my last clean white shirt. 15 minutes before we got to Soda Springs seemed like 50 hours that we reached Soda Springs and the train slowed down. No passengers were at the station, so the train didn't stop, just slowed down. My 10 minutes had begun. I made my way to the baggage car. The baggage man was reading a newspaper. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, what can I do for you? I'd uh, like to check this suitcase. Oh, <laughs> forgot to do it at the station, eh? Uh, right hand over here. Uh, I'll give you a baggage check. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, uh, this suitcase uh, feels empty. Are you sure you want to... Uh, I'd appreciate it if you put your hands up. Oh, 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 what is this? In simple language... 
A train robbery. Now, let's just start walking that way. Well, but, but, but that's, the, that's an American car, I mister. Know, I know. Oh, now look. Hey! Just do as I tell you and no one will get hurt. Walk in front of me. Now, uh, knock and yell for the guards to open the door to the mail car. Okay, mister. It's, it's your funeral. <clears throat> hey, Rhett, open up. It's Harold. What do you want, Harold? Pardon me, but would you Put up your hand. What are you talking about? You'll want me to shoot this man, and I wouldn't want to do that. What is this? A train robbery. Now, I'd appreciate it if you gentlemen would back up against that wall. That's it. That's it. Now, thank you. I'll uh, just remove these guns from your holsters. I just like bloodshed, and I'm afraid you gentlemen might be tempted. There we are. You're making a big mistake, mister. <laughs> you sound just like my wife. Now, let's see. Because it's going to take just one bag, but there's so many, I think. I'll take two. One apiece. Might as well. Here's one. Two. How are you expecting to get off the train, mister? The emergency cord will take care of that. Put it to slow the train down. Now, I have one more favor to ask of you, sir. Kindly open the side door of the car. He's gonna jump? He's crazy! Not just yet. We have about 30 seconds to go. Now, open the door, please. 10 seconds. 5, 4, 3, 2, now! Ooh. Oh, you made it, Cousin Walter. How'd it go? Perfect, Cousin Eugene. Perfect. Look, look under these dirty shirts. Why, you you took two bags. I told you to only take one. I know, but I figured it'd be easier dividing it with two bags. <laughs> we drove straight through to Sacramento, and when we got there, Eugene had to separate with me. I hated to see Eugene go. I'd grown very fond of him in the short time we'd been in business together. The house looked the same as I drove up. Maybe now I'll have it painted. I thought to myself, there was a car parked in front of the house, though. Probably another salesman. I took the suitcase with my share of the money in it from the back seat and walked up to the front door. I had a wonderful feeling inside. Why, Walter! Walter, dear! No, Bess! Walter, Walter, where have you been? Have I been? Bess, you know very well where I've been. I, I'm so glad to see you, dear. Bess, what's wrong? Come on, come into the living room and... Sit down. I don't understand why you're acting so hysterical. Really, I don't, Bess. They're from the police station. Uh, these men, the police station? Oh, but look, Bess, I, uh, I think I'll go upstairs and get cleaned up a bit. There's plenty of time for that later. Now, you just tell me where you've been. Your wife has been worried about you. Two men. Two men drowned in the lake at Lake Tahoe. They didn't know who they were, and then when I tried calling the Hillary Lodge, they told me you and Eugene didn't even register there. Oh, I see. I, I just got worried sick. Just worried sick. So I called the police station. Oh, Walter, put down that suitcase and... Tell us what happened. Uh, later, Bess. Later. Later. Later? Oh, look at you, Walter. Your clothes all wrinkled. Dirty shirt. Oh, you just look a mess. Bess, I'm sorry I worried you. I'm just glad you're home. And you won't be getting out of my sight again for a long time. I'll tell you that. Uh, Mrs. Beaumont, uh, we're happy your husband arrived home safely. Uh, oh, yes, I am two officers, but look at the condition he's arrived in. I bet he doesn't even have a clean shirt to work on Monday morning. Walter, give me that suitcase. No, uh, wait, Bess. Uh, give it to me. I'll just get your dirty shirts and we'll put them in the washer. Okay, Come on. Bob, I guess you won't be need us anymore, Mrs. Beaumont. Give me the suitcase. No, Bess, please, Don't. please. Hey, hey, 
Okay, folks, for our next rendezvous, we are switching from real trains to toy trains, and instead of someone that you should not take your cues from, we're going to do a sketch from the ideal American family from the 1950s, Ozzy and Harry. The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, starring the entire Nelson family. Ozzy, Harriet, David, and Ricky. This afternoon, there's not much going on in the Nelson's home. Just look at Ricky. He's stretched down the floor. There's David. He's lounging on the couch. And there's Ozzy slumped in the armchair. Well, David. Well, what, Ricky? What should we do? Why can't we just relax? That's a waste of valuable time. I'm not getting any younger, you know. How about playing some cards? Who wants to play Go Fish all afternoon? Okay, then. Let's set up the chessboard. I didn't know you could play chess, Ricky. He's pretty good. Last time we played, he took out all my men with only five shots from his bean shooter. Oh. Well, it seems pretty quiet in here. Oh, yeah. Well, we're trying to think of something to do. Uh, I suggested cards. I'll volunteer for a round of double solitaire. You're on, Mom. I'll get the card table. Okay? It's in the closet. Okay. How are we supposed to get the card table with all this junk in front of it? This big box is in the way. Uh, drag it out here, Dave. Uh, this is hard to handle. Oh, look out for the footstool. What style? Now give us a swan dive. Don't be funny. In case you didn't notice, the thing I dropped was your electric train. You mean, that's what it used to be. Oh, I don't think I heard it. It didn't drop very far. I think it's getting pretty old. Anyway, why don't you just put it, dump it back in the box? Oh, don't you think you should check it over first? Yeah, I guess so. Let's see. Yep, that's my electric toy train. Dump it back in the box. Like the man said when we bought it, there's nothing like an electric chain to make a small girl boy go wild with delight. <laughs> Come to think of it, Ricky, you haven't played with your train for quite a while. I guess I just grew out of it. I'm not a small boy anymore. Well, Rick, as long as you're not using your train, why don't you carry out it out to the garage? It's a lot handier in the closet. I thought you weren't interested in it anymore. I'm not, but I'm not interested in carrying it out into the garage either. Oh, but you will do it, won't you? I don't think there's any doubt about that. Do you want to give me a hand pop? Oh, yeah, oh, sure. I was just uh, looking at the caboose. It's even got a little stove right there on the side. Yeah, pretty corny. I don't think so. You know, this train's a pretty expensive toy just to store away. Maybe... Maybe you ought to give it another try first. It doesn't interest me anymore. All it does is go round and round. Ricky can't stand the competition. <laughs> Listen, David, I'm not as dumb as you think. I'd show you if I had a chemistry set. What's this about a chemistry set? I wish I had one. Georgie Duncan's got a set. We've been working on a big experiment. I can see the headlines now. Ricky Nelson invents colored water. I think I know how to get you a chemistry set. Golly, how? Well, you're tired of your train, and I think the hobby shop takes in trade-ins. That's a swell idea. What do you think, Pop? Well, the oil car looks really... Oh, I suppose they'd make you a train. We'll do it first thing in the morning. i got to get over to Georgie's now. We're about to wind up our biggest experiment. What are you making? We, I'll... Well, I'd rather not say with David here. Besides, what's so funny about colored water? I don't think it's a good idea to make a train for a chemistry set. Uh, Ricky's interest in trains is liable to revive one of these days. Oh, I agree. It'll probably revive about the time he has a son of his own. What do you mean? Put down the coal car and I'll explain. Oh, well, don't be <laughs> silly. Look, look, let's see if it's damaged. That gag about fathers and trains. 
hardly concerns me. Oh, I thought I saw, caught a conductor's gleam in your eye. No, I'm not the type. Aren't you and David going shopping or something? Pretty soon. Maybe if you went out a little early, you, uh, you might avoid some of those crowds. Oh, well, I have plenty of time. It's just a beautiful day out. Yes, it is. Well, come on. Get going so I can set this train up. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. I am working on the railroad just to pass the town. Just a minute. Hi, Thorny. Hi, Oz. What's going on in here? Uh, nothing, nothing at all. I'm sure I heard a low whistle when I walked by. Well, maybe you just thought you heard the whistle, Thorny. Uh huh. Uh, you're all alone, just you and the train? Now, wait a minute, Thorny. If you think I was playing with Ricky's train, well, I, I'm not the type to play with kids' toys. I have uh, better things to do, and... And the engine's still warm. And the engine's still warm. Now, Ozzy, it's nothing to be ashamed of. We all have to face second childhood sometime. <laughs> well, for your information, I was just trying to figure out what the... Thing is worth. Uh, Ricky wants to trade it in for a chemistry set. Hey, how lucky can you get? There's no end of exciting things a father can do with one of those chemistry sets. Look, I'll admit that some men could be interested in a thing like this, but not me. Uh, uh, Want to help me put it in the box? Ricky's going to trade it in tomorrow. Okay. You say, why don't we take it down to the store for him? We can probably make a better deal than he can. Well, uh, don't you think I ought to check with Ricky first? Why? <laughs> you want to get the best deal, don't you? Come on, let's take it out of Talbot's Hobby Shop. You know, uh, they have a real big model train layout down there at Talbot's. Oh. Well, uh, Ricky is pretty eager for the chemistry set. They let the customers operate it. Beautiful trains, just like the real thing. I'll get my coat. Good afternoon, may I help you? Yes, uh, thank you. Do you buy used electric trains? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we accept them as trade-ins, uh, if they're in good shape. Oh, I think you'll find this one's in excellent condition. It's my boy's train. He feels he's outgrown this sort of thing, and he wants to exchange it for a chemistry set. Well, he might have lost interest because he doesn't have all the equipment now. You step over here where we... Have our trains. I'll show you what I mean. Don't go, Ozzy. He's just trying to sell you something. Thorny, Thorny, it, it, it won't hurt to look. Here we are. We're very proud of this setup. Oh, oh. this is a real layout. Oh, I don't need too far over the rail. Our rocket express is due any minute. It does look pretty realistic. <laughs> We've developed a few unusual railroad techniques. See, it's, it's our automatic cattle loader. Watch, he tickles all the cows up in the ramp and into the car. That's pretty clever. Come on, Oz, let's look at the chemistry set. Just a minute, Thorny. Uh, would you mind showing me how to work this train? No, 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 not at all. Uh, this handle controls the speed, and these levers Work the switches. You say this handle controls the speed, huh? That's right! Go, 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 drive, drive, drive! Okay, thanks. Oh, 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 boy! Look at it tear along. Make way for the express! Oh, oh! I I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to wreck it. No, 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 there's no damage. It uh, takes a while to get the neck of it. All right, I I suppose it does. Here, I'll, I'll put it back on the track. Oh, no, 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 no! We never! touch the trains with our hands. Oh, we just bring the wrecker out of the roundhouse and use its crane to lift the car. Try it. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, boy. This is a pretty efficient looking crane. Once I get around this turn. <laughs> Have you got a wrecker to pick up wreck wreckers? Uh, I don't think you gentlemen realize how many grown men have taken up miniature railroading as a hobby. I know one boy was trying to take up chemistry as a hobby. Right, Oz? Oh, yeah, you're right. Say, where did I put Ricky's train? Oh, it's right here, here, here. 
However, a trade-in value of a train like this is small, actually. It could be worth a lot more to keep it as a starter set for a real layout. That's a point. Uh, maybe we'd better bring him down and let him take a look. Ah, uh, for heaven's sake. All right, Bony. All right, I'll, I'll trade it. Maybe you too are interested in model railroading. Whether you are young like Ricky or older like Ozzy, miniature trains are a great hobby. Tonight, we have visitors from the Toy Train Operating Society. Please visit John and Joan Spall at their booth to learn more about model railroads. Or visit their winter train show in Stillwater on February 18th to meet hundreds of people who are involved in operating selling, displaying, and playing with miniature trains. Now, back to Ozzy and Harriet. Hi, Harriet. Hi, dear. Woo. What's in the big box? Well, it just so happens to be the apple of our young son's eye, a brand new chemistry set. You didn't trade Ricky's train for that, did you? Yes, I certainly did. It, <gasps> it was your idea. Hey, what's in the big box, Pop? Well, it's a little surprise for a guy named Ricky. And now, then, would you, uh, what would you like it to be most of all? That's easy. I'd like a new cattle loader and some automatic switches for my train. <laughs> if I could find my train. Oh, uh, your train? Sure. Boy, I'm glad I didn't trade it in. Georgie and I are going to put both our trains together and make one terrific set. Can I open the box now? Uh, Ricky, uh, that advice about trading the train was very sound. Your, your mother's advice. But, well, <laughs> there are certain disappointments in life sometimes. Uh, good intentions go awry. Uh, things don't always come out like we might... Uh, Seemingly, that's a paradox at first blush, but actually it's a... You do understand, don't you? Oh, sure, Pop. Will you run through it again? <coughs> Dear, your father's trying to say that he traded your train for a chemistry set. You mean my train's gone? No, no. Uh, <laughs> well, yes. Uh, <laughs> but I'll get it right back. I... Sure, like it back, but if you think I should have a chemistry set... Oh, no, no, no. Uh, actually, Ruck, I think this chemistry set is probably a little old for you. I'll, I'll go right down and get our, uh, I mean, your train set. It's okay. Chemistry is kind of fun. Georgie and I invented a swell perfume. <gasps> Sounds delightful. It smells delightful, too. Boy, it sure is cold at Georgie's house with all the windows open. <laughs> Look, forget the chemistry set. We're getting that train back. And maybe we'll get a new cattle loader. Oh, boy. Yes, sir. And some automatic switches and a new water tower and a gate name. And a new dress. And a tunnel and a crane and a dump car. And a hat and a fur coat. And a fur coat. And an alligator bag. And an allig and a now, wait a minute. Aren't you getting a little carried away? Oh, I'm with you, dear. Oh, well, I... I'd better get going. I'll come along. I need some things downtown. Then come on. Boy, Georgie and I are going to have a swell layout railroad. Let's set the train up right here in our room. Well, it's okay with me if you want to put it right here in the den. <laughs> this is the place, Harriet. Wait till you see their model railroad outfit. Oh, it's you, sir. What can I do for you? It's about this chemistry set and my son. Oh, now don't worry, sir. You feed him lots of warm, soapy water, he'll be good as new in no time. Oh, no. It's nothing like that. Uh, this chemistry set isn't exactly what he wants. Oh! Well, after all, it was only twelve ninety-five. No, no, it, it's not that. Uh, it's just, well, it's sort of a long, involved story. We'd like to exchange the chemistry set back for the train back. Yes, uh... That's the situation in a nutshell. Well, boys will change their mind. Happens every day. How did you convince him? I didn't have anything to do with it. Can we make the exchange? Oh, certainly. It'll take a minute. Let's see. I uh, think my partner took your son's train into the back. Well, 
I'll show my wife your setup. I may be interested in a in a few accessories. Well, fine. Help yourself. You can run it if you like. Okay, thanks. Aren't you a little worried I might wreck it again? No, no. Confidentially, we find that our men customers drive much better when their wives are along. Oh, I'll be careful. Harriet, isn't this a swell layout? Oh, yeah, it's very nice. Oh, I'm afraid I have some bad news. My partner sold your son's train just a little while ago. Oh, that's a shame. Gee, do you have any other used trains? No, I'm afraid we don't. Oh, now, wait a minute. There is one thing I could do for you. Sell you a new train. Well, thanks, but I don't really want to put out that much. Well, money. I'm sure we could find something reasonable. Here, here, just, just glance through this catalog. Okay. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, hey, this one looks pretty reasonable. I bet Ricky will like it. It's set number 100 for $20. Ozzy, I don't think so. That, that catalog says set number 20 for $100. Oh, well, I think I'll keep the chemistry set. Ricky will understand, I hope. It's OK, Pop. I understand. If a train's gone, it's gone. Anyway, I still have the chemistry set. That's a pretty nice one, too. Well, I'll bet you'll have a lot of fun playing with it. Sure, I will, I suppose. I'll show you some stuff I learned in my chemistry class. Okay, that should take about 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm certainly proud of the way Ricky took the disappointment. Well, so am I. Say, uh, don't let Thorny know how I feel about these trains. How come? Well, you know he thinks they're silly. He accused me of being in a second childhood just because I looked at Ricky's train. Mom's the word. Come on in, Thorny. Hello, Harriet. Hello, Oz. Hi, Thorny. What can I do for you? Just answer one question. You big crook. What's the big idea of selling me a train without a transformer? Wait a minute. Never mind. Just hand over my transformer. Don't tell me. You're the guy who bought Ricky's train. Just hand it over. I left the transformer here by mistake. If it wasn't sold with the train, it isn't yours. You seem awfully eager to get it. Oh, oh no, Oz. I don't want it, actually, old buddy. The only reason I bought it was to save you from Ooh. yourself. I, I saw that. Mad glint in your eye. I knew that if I didn't snap it up, you'd be back to get it yourself. Well, that's very thoughtful of you. Doubt it's true, however. Oh, Oz, believe me, my only thought was to clear your path of petty temptations. Yeah, but what's the use? Take it. It's yours for just 15 bucks more than the man allowed you. 15 for what? For the cattle loader and switches I bought. <laughs> Oh, you two. Honestly, it frightens me every time you leave the house alone. I guess it does sound a little silly. That was a pretty sneaky deal you tried to pull, getting me to sell the train so you could buy it. Oh, Waz. I apologize. I should have known better. Trains have caused me problems for the last 20 years, ever since I stepped onto Catherine's on the way to the altar. <laughs> Hey, that's my train, isn't it? It sure looks like it. Well, yeah, I guess it is, Rick. That's a new cattle loader over there, too, and some switches. Come on, David. Let's set it up. Sure. Thorny, can you imagine us down there on our hands and knees playing with a toy? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine what came over us. No. Oh, uh, Ricky, uh, those two wires go to the transformer. Oh, yeah? David, you hook up the cattle car. OK, Ricky. You know, I think I'll join some kind of book club and... Oh, uh, Dave, I think the platform goes on the other side of the track. I don't think so, Pop. Uh, Ricky, uh, <laughs> those switches will never work in that position. No, no, Thorny, this is the perfect place. Well, then I insist we put our signal here. Well, okay, now, let's see. The wire to this switch should connect here, and this wire should go to the power supply for the track. <laughs> David? Yeah, Ricky? I think my train has a new conductor. Yeah. 
David? Yeah? How the heck do you play double solitaire? <laughs> grown to be our custom, yes. we make sure that we write and produce a new radio show at just about every one of our productions. We do it for a few reasons. Number one, we believe that the Edmund History Museum should facilitate, not just celebrate history. Number two, it gives us a chance to celebrate these great actors. And number three, it is fun. So, <coughs> our final production for the evening, Rough Tracks. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, members of the Grand Order of Occidental Otters, tonight's broadcast is full of chills. I'll never marry a man with halitosis. <laughs> That's what my last three wives said. Will! <laughs> I shall save thee, my love. And kills! Excuse me? I said kills. Not tonight, mister. This is a family establishment. Amen, sister, amen. Chills, thrills, and sufficiently dangerous, but let's not go nuts here, pal, circumstances, on tonight's episode of Rough Tracks, brought to you by Cars. Cars. Going to the places you have to be every day, whether you want to be there or not. Cars. Now, dear listeners, imagine, if you will, a sleepy little frontier town not unlike your own Hamlet a hundred or so years ago, but sufficiently different enough not to anger any sticklers for historical accuracy. There it is, the schoolhouse, the chapel, the tavern, and the trains. Yes, trains whistling their arrivals. <coughs> trains chugging their freight. Trains shoving a load of livestock all the way from Kansas City. <laughs> but what's this? Something sinister has slipped onto the tracks today, friendly passengers. It's none other than that dastardly ne'er-do-well, Ebenezer Caligula Canker. That's Ebenezer Caligula Canker the third. You second-rate buscare. And today, I shall wear none other than this beatific beauty, the maiden of the prairie, little Belladora John. Never! <laughs> I'll never marry a man with such a punyant odor, foot odor. <laughs> oh, yes, you will. You will powder my socks and wash my stockings. For I will tie you to these railroad tracks until you relent your dire protestations. <laughs> but, just as the ne'er-do-well nabob had fastened our fair female to the tracks, none other than the maiden's own mother answered the hue and cry of her beloved baby girl. Yes, the Dowager Jar, owner of the county's single largest muffin tin, and the winner of three consecutive stocking darning competitions. Mama Tarju Zakrizami. Now that's enough of your fancy talk, sir. We haven't any need for such highfalutin words in this humble setting. This is the God fearing town. He already forgot my full name. <laughs> and him a guest in these parts, too. Shame. impatient. Can we focus on the matter at hand? Yes, let's stay on track, shall we? <laughs> oh, dear man, I'm afraid you've, we've already fallen far off the rails. Not off the rails quite yet. I'm afraid, dear Dowager Jar, on the rails she shall stay until your dear Bella agrees to become my blushing bride. That's just what I mean, Mr. Kanker. Ebenezer Caligula Kanker the third, the sinister, sacrilegious. I down. I just. The idea interrupting an old woman's conversation. Now just you quiet down while we commiserate our business. Sorry, dear. I should say, it's becoming very hard to keep on track. 
Uh, speaking of tracks... Hush, uh, Bella. Mama's talking to the nice man. Now, Mr. Kinkle. A dowager jar, or should I say mother? I'd say you shouldn't, but you'll soon know why. Do you consider yourself a respectable person? Hmm. I am a registered member of the Republican, Democratic, and Transcontinental Unionist Bull Pigeon Party. Just ask him what he thinks of suffrage. And you come from good stock, would you say? Madam, the blood in my vein is as azure as blueberries. Not to mention skin as green as spinach. Do you make a good living? Oh, well, at the risk of being improper, dear lady. You mean besides the kidnapping and attempted murder? I can safely surmise that I, Ebenezer, Caligula, Kanker, the third, am the wealthiest man in three states, four counties, and 184 townships. In that case, Mr. Kanker. Yes? In that case... Mother! Don't say in that case, gentle listeners, we must hiatus our high-speed adventure for a special word from our sponsor. This segment is brought to you by coffee. Yes, coffee. Waking you up every day to do the things you really don't want to do at times that no one should be awake. Try coffee. Now, back to our program. The train towards town proceeds apace. Our heroine hungers for release. I'm about to get really steamed. The livestock grow restless. <laughs> Our doting dowager was on the precipice of yielding her daughter, Belladora Jars, virtue to the villainous canker. We return now to her fateful reply that could spell either funeral dirges or wedding bells for our beloved beauty. I'm sorry, Mr. Kanker. I truly am. What? You reject my solicitations. You remonstrate. Calamity. Deceit. Now you shall know true heartbreak, dear woman, as the locomotive rends your dead daughter across the tracks. <laughs> you misunderstand, Mr. Kanker. You are a fine man. Established, renowned, obviously committed. Just once, and it was a reputable sanitarian, not some lowly asylum. <laughs> committed to my daughter, Belladora. Ah, yes. Did you go cuckoo or choo-choo? Bella! <laughs> I'm here all night, folks. <laughs> Apparently. As I was about to say, though, you have many excellent qualities, Mr. Kanker, but you cannot marry my daughter. Because in precious moments you shall have no daughter to marry, madam? No, that's hardly the reason. The reason you cannot male, wed Belladora is because... Sable! Pastor? Pastor Prime? Sable! I've been looking here, there, and everywhere for you. Why didn't you tell me to meet you here? Meet you where, Pastor? The wedding, of course. Mr. Kanker here asked me to officiate his nuptials to your little Bella. Brought my good boot, brought my best suit. Couldn't come at a worse time. Oh, no. There, Bella, don't say it. You've gone and eloped, ain't you? Worse, Pastor. <gasps> you mean they done converted to Pentecostal? <laughs> Say it ain't so, Sybil. It ain't so, Sybil. Pastor Prime, dear Dowager Jar was just about to explain why there won't be any joining in matrimony today. Dowager, and remember, the train is running on time. Will that make me a wedding crasher? Bella! Tip your waitress, folks. The reason my Bella can't marry Mr. Kanker is quite simple. Because, Mr. Kanker, you are simply too good for my little girl. Mother! Sibyl! Oh, shouldn't I be the judge of that? A man who has had three wives is hardly a judge of wifely virtue, Mr. Kanker. And I'm here to tell you that just because my Bella is quite a character 
Does it mean she has any character? <laughs> Never! Sibyl! <gasps> a damsel in distress, a devil delivered by dire straits, and a locomotive lumbering towards a looming disaster. Can Belladora Jar be saved? Can Ebenezer Caligula Kanker the Third kidnapped his way into connubial bliss? Will Pastor Prime acquire more congregants than the First Pentecostal Church and Temperance Union? Hope so, or else it's back to selling snake oil in Little Rock. Find out in the stirring conclusion to this week's episode of Rock Tracks. But in the meantime, <laughs> amicable audience, have you considered cats? Yes, tonight's final sponsor is cats. Cats are wonderful companions for people who want to come home, but also want to be abused with scratches, hisses, and the occasional bite. Want to take care of something that will treat you like a slave? Cats. Ever wonder what it would be like to have your own home taken over by a creature one-tenth of your size? Cats. That's cats, except no substitutes for domestic resentment and marginal pain. Try cats today. Uh, now, our thrilling conclusion to Rough Tracks, a cars, coffee, and cats program. Our train ends closer to its destination, but between it and the depot is a damsel of discarded virtue. Now, and your jar has just attempted to persuade her captor, that guy, that little Bella Jar, Dollar Dora Jar, is no fit wife for such a saintly sociopath. But just as the train rounds Dead Man's Curve, <coughs> just as Bella arrives at her wit's end, Buddy, you are really starting to grind my gears. Just as Pastor Prime considers a change in careers, wonder if there's any money in those moving pictures they keep talking about. Just in your faithful announcer could not possibly stall for suspense any longer comes Vine. Vine? Captain Vine. Vine. Captain Bovine at your service, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Pastor, I desire the darling, daring, far flung from the frontier, the wild wonder of the untamed prairie, the one the only, the typical only available by appointment only because of how hypnotically handsome am I, Captain Bovine. <laughs> You're too late, Vine. The train proceeds apiece. Your true love is doomed. And the Pentecostals are having a tent meeting tomorrow evening. Calamity! Mercy! Actually. Yes, yes my love? Uh, actually. What's this? Actually, I think I, uh, uh, <coughs> wait, wait, there, there, actually, I think I just man about managed to untie myself from this not-so-tight hitch clove knot. Ah, there we go. Traps! Oh, what can I say? I never did join the scouts. <laughs> and besides, these delicate hands chafe when they thrust too much jute hemp. Oh, you've won this time, Vine. Vine? Vine! Excuse me, I was the one who untied myself, Bo. Mm -hmm. You're sweet, but let's be honest, you're not the sharpest egg in the hen house. I do okay. <laughs> Honey, remember when you took that census survey last spring? The results came back negative. <laughs> How do you fail a survey? With honor! <laughs> Mother, head, home! I've had just about enough of your praising my suitability as a spouse. You see, Bella, it's wishy-washy talk like that that has left you without prospects an old maid. I'm 23! Not so loud, dear. There are children present. 23? Oh. Well, I never... At her age, she can only produce 12 or 13 children. <laughs> Madam Bella, you have played me for a fool. I thought you were a maiden in the prime of her, of her youth. 
You are almost in the twilight of your bloom. Stick a thorn in it, canker. <coughs> we all know you only want to get married because you can't take care of yourself, can't cook, can't clean. You have to go into a dressing room just to change your mind. <laughs> I just need someone to make me a soft-boiled egg. I thought that train would never come! Well, do you mean to tell me you wanted the train to arrive? <laughs> of course! I can't wait to get out of this one muffin tin town. This is my train, and I'm headed out as fast as I can! But Belladonna, I love you! Oh, make an appointment! Bella, please, I need you! You need a good maid and a subscription to Ladies Home Journal. <laughs> Bella, you're making a disgrace of yourself. Come off that train pla platform this instant. Sorry, Mother. I, I can't quite make out what you're saying. It must be my, my hearing is going out in old age. Hey, Pastor, want to come along? There's a circus three counties over, and they're looking for geeks. Ooh! Well, it beats having to listen to the gossip at the women's prayer breakfast every week. That's the spirit, Pastor. So long, y'all. I'm heading to the wrong side of the tracks at the end of the line. <laughs> a jilted jingle jangle hero, a rejected repugnant rascal, and an ever hopeful damsel looking forward to making her own distress. Stay tuned next week for another exciting episode of Rough Tracks, brought to you by shoes, chairs, and fingernail clippers. <laughs> Until then, stay on the rail, folks. Thank <laughs> you.